This promoted episode is brought to us by our friends at Retool. And unlike most of my promoted episodes, instead of, great, what, what story do we want to tell? I gave a slightly politer, but not by much, version of, all right, sit down, shut up, and I'm about to tell people about your product and you about your product because this is one I'm deeply passionate about. My guest slash target for my slings, arrows, and more or less product complaints as I go along is Devin Groff, who's in customer engineering over at Retool. Devin, thank you for being brave. Thanks for having me, Corey. Excited to talk about your app. So let's, before we dive in and show the nuanced nonsense of how I use slash misuse slash abuse your product, what is Retool? So Retool is a fast way to build internal tools. And what that means in practice is that organizations use us to build everything from their admin dashboards to internal workflows uh, to manage various business critical processes. I want to be very clear because I'm always a fan of disclosing things like this. I am and have been a paying customer of Retool for years because in my world, there's nothing more obnoxious than someone who doesn't pay you anything, but also shows up to criticize your products. Yeah, most of the things I criticize in any real depth are things I am absolutely paying for. In the case of a few specific AWS services, I'm paying through the nose for them, but that's neither here nor there. Now, let's dive in a little bit and talk about the problem that I tend to see and how I tend to view it. Specifically, I write a newsletter every week called Last Week in AWS. And if you go to lastweekinaws.com, if, if you're not already, you should subscribe to it. And it looks a little something like this when it hits your inbox in on the course of a Monday or a Wednesday for the blog post version or the Thursday for the roundup of AWS security nonsense. And it's, it's visually appealing. It's platypus themed. It winds up being very, I guess, aesthetically nice compared to the plain text nonsense I was originally setting out. And I was gobsmacked when I learned you could choose a font, for example. This might surprise you, but I don't write it as raw HTML every day because I, I'm a sad sack, but not that sad. Originally, I used to draft the very early versions of this in a Google Doc, and it took me about eight hours a week of sitting there, moving it around just so. Then I realized I was probably not going to get rid of writing a newsletter in anything approaching a reasonable time frame. So there's got to be a better way to do this. Ah, doing the same thing repeatedly sounds like a job for computers. So I started writing some Python scripts. In time, those Python scripts started talking to other Python scripts. I suppose I should probably take a little bit of credit for not writing one enormous omnibus monolith script. But at this scale, I'm not entirely sure it would have mattered. And that worked out well for a while. I started building in some error checking and some other stuff because I was tired of sending out wrong links. And it got more and more complex with time. And then I started traveling a lot more with basically just an iPad as my only computer. And putting this together required an awful lot of, I'm going to run this script from a shell prompt. Things continued to evolve, and I started having other people who needed to be involved in the process, such as operations folks who handle some of the scheduling aspect. And there's a bit of an editorial firewall every week between who is sponsored a given issue and who and what I'm writing about. I don't generally find out who is sponsoring an issue until after I've written it, which in the case of Retool, for example, it would be a little disingenuous for me to basically have a whole screed this week over some article that, oh yeah, Retool sucks and here's why. This issue is sponsored by our friends at Retool. It's, it's a little disingenuous, but I also don't want to avoid saying things critically about Retool in this example just because they happen to be sponsoring an issue. It's always been a serious concern because you can buy my attention, but not my opinion. And in time, I've started making silly mistakes. This got more and more complicated and I needed to simplify all of it. Today, the architecture for how this whole thing works in simplified form, believe it or not, looks a lot like this. And that is more than a little terrifying. Let's be very clear here. In the event that I were to wind up giving this to someone else, they would immediately do the smart thing, chuck the entire thing away and start over from scratch. Because this is a Rube Goldberg style contraption of a whole bunch of Lambda functions tied into tied to API gateways, tied into things behind the scene. And that's, that's great. It works, kind of. But using curl to fire this stuff off wasn't really the right idea. Hitting a random web URL. 
So I started talking to people about, okay, if I want to hire someone to do some JavaScript work, what is that going to look like? And the answers didn't thrill me. And whenever I try and work with JavaScript myself, I come away more confused than I was when I started because JavaScript, anyone who says, oh, front end is way easier than back end is a fool. Let me just say that now. And one of the people that I was talking to said, well, have you considered using Retool? Well, what's Retool? And he gave a, an explanation that was vaguely akin to what you just said, Devin. And then I started playing around with it. And at first I was delighted. This, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And then I got angry. How did I not know about this? Where has this been the entire time that I've been building nonsense together? And now I just want to tell other people about this so they can go through that same cycle of anger, angst, and delight as well, because this works effectively perfectly for how I think about building these things out. So Devin, thank you for agreeing to come with me on our journey through the nonsense that I'm about to inflict on people. Of course. Uh, again, thanks for having me. And exactly what you just described is how a lot of people end up actually finding retool. It's that they go and they're looking for some way to build these front ends and they don't necessarily have a good solution in front of them. They either have to go and spend tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire a JavaScript developer, or they have to buckle down, pull themselves up by the, their bootstraps and do it themselves. Uh, or they use something like us. And when they find us, they go through that cycle of first being upset. How did I not know this existed to suddenly being delighted that there's this platform out there that they can do these sort of things. And so, uh, the, the flow you described is not uncommon. We see this all the time. If I pop over to this, it, it isn't that visually impressive to begin with. This is a list of the various retool apps that I have, some of which are scattered away in folders. Uh, but the, the one that I really want to talk about is one I call Next Week in AWS. And when I click it, it spins for a bit and it loads. I want to point out a few things before we dive in. First and foremost, the use case, remember, is a web app that other people who aren't me can use. That's important. The next is when I'm traveling, it would be great if I could do it from an iPad, which means that, oh, it's going to be this, this super tiny touch targets and all the rest. It has to work on, a, on an iPad device. And the third is, well, how is this going to work on an iPhone? Well, Retool does have options for that, and I don't care because I'm never going to sit there writing the newsletter on my phone because I'm, I'm sad, but I'm not that sad, come on. So this is what I look at every week when I am building out the next week's newsletter. And this is, as we look at this, what is currently in the hopper. I can see that there are 81 links that are currently in the queue. As we can tell from the previous architecture diagram, a lot of those are fed in automatically via AWS RSS feeds being fed in as well. If I instead wind up going to, oh, I don't know, a very, some news site or whatnot, and I take a look at what's going on in various ways. For example, here we have one where IBM is now apparently uh, having some of its files from a lawsuit included. Let's pretend for a second this is even slightly germane to AWS. Let's, so I could, there are a few things that I could do here. It used to be that I was using some bookmarking utility or another, and I went through a couple iterations of it. I didn't like having that third-party dependency in the loop quite as much because there was lag, there was latency, there was downtime right at the time I was writing these things, usually on the weekend, middle of the night, while crying because I procrastinate, and it would just error out and I would have problems. So I built my own, more or less, bookmarking tool as I go. If I want to put this in the things from the community, I click a bookmarklet, in my browser, wait for a sec for a Lambda to wake up, and then at the top it says, great success, telling me that it worked. If it broke, it would say that there was an error. And then I don't think about it again. Back over in Retool land, if I hit the refresh, it goes from 81 to 82 because it works effectively instantly. And once I do that, I don't have to think about it again. I have iOS shortcuts on the iPad and on the, on the iPhone. If I'm reading something, it's just two taps away and then it's captured and I don't have to think about it again as I go throughout my week. And I can click on any particular uh, bit of nonsense here if I want to expand this out just a smidgen. Great. So now that I'm back, you could see that it winds up going to, it's gone from 81 to 82. 
Now, if I wind up taking a look at the various uh, at the various content that I've written already, anything that doesn't have anything there is listed as empty because this dates from a time when DynamoDB didn't accept empty fields and it was just easier. I have checks that make sure that there's nothing with the word empty going out. If, you're, if you've been a subscriber for a long time, you might have seen a few of those sneak their way through. And it goes into different sections, and I'll get to that in a moment. Now, as I look through about things that I care about or things that I don't, for example, I don't particularly care about ECS supporting warm pools, which is a really unfortunate name for a company with a peeing in bottles controversy a while back, but all right. I also don't particularly care about Amazon Kendra releasing a thing. And I can wind up looking through and seeing pretty quickly what happens here. And when I'm done checking things I don't care about, I hit save changes, it fires off those deletes in parallel, and because it's Lambda, it scales automatically, and by deleting two, I'm now down to 80. I try and get it to around 30, give or take, in the course of a week, scattered across everything. Now, that's how I do the Monday list. I have a blog post. If I go to one that I actually wrote last week and put out, I do not edit in the CMS. One never does that, or you learn to regret it. And of course, I have the same thing on security in various ways, and it just populates based entirely upon the section. In any given Monday, there's a title, which should be self-explanatory as a subject line. There's a hidden Easter egg in every issue that if you click the good morning at the top, it'll drop you to a tweet that I made over the past week that I find interesting, and I can curate those. And then there's an intro where I talk about snarky nonsense. And when I click the generate HTML button, it spits out exactly what you would expect. Now, as a part of that publication process, if I hit the copy email content, it copies the HTML into the clipboard, and then it gets pasted by hand, like we're ancient caribou, into mail sending application, in this case, ConvertKit, which is moving slowly toward having a broadcast API, so I don't have to do that. Now, all this is well and good, but okay, how is this any different than what you would expect for, I don't know, building some custom JavaScript app? Well, remember, I'm bad at JavaScript. So if we edit this application, it effectively changes the entirety of what it is we're looking at. It, it reframes it and winds up offering a whole bunch of different areas here. The best descriptor I've found for what Retool really is, more or less, is Visual Basic for front end. Granted, obviously, for internal use cases, but for a variety of reasons, Devin, I suspect that you don't want to be sued, so you can't actually put that on a billboard, if I had to guess. We cannot put that on a billboard, um, but that is a common uh, comparison that, that we hear is that folks see us as a more modern version of Visual Basic um, or just like a WYSIWYG editor. Um, that said, I, I want to be clear here that Retool isn't no code. It's not the case that you're just stuck with these components that you're pulling onto the screen. We provide these building blocks because we believe that you shouldn't sit down and have to program another button or another table. You shouldn't have to figure out how to do that from scratch and waste a bunch of time. You just use ours. But let's say you hate our button. You say it's the worst button I've ever seen and I want to make my own. You can also have a custom component in there and still write things from scratch. So it's supposed to provide those building blocks. But it's not like this trap where you're stuck on a set of rails and you're going to go forward on those rails and you can't ever break out. There are escape hatches left and right to be able to make sure that you get the app you need. It's Handy, especially when I can tag someone in who knows a little bit about JavaScript in a way that I don't to just, hey, I've been beating my head off of this for two days and they come back with a one-liner in Slack or on Twitter in 10 seconds. And it's, yeah, it turns out there is no compression algorithm for expertise unless you count, you know, asking someone who knows what they're doing, what a concept. So let me give an example here. Let's say I want a button, which is a common thing to do. If I grab the button, move it over here somewhere, and drop it into place, it'll wind up saying button on it. It'll look with the same color theme I've given the whole thing. Great, and I click it, and I can change the text on it, for example. Uh, we'll call it shitpost, because why not? That's a great thing to do. And it gives me a bunch of different options for what type of button it is. Default is what I'm used to in this case. Event handlers is sort of the interesting thing we're gonna come back to in a minute. But there are a bunch of different options. I can wind up hiding it, doing all kinds of nonsense. I can custom theme it. I can decide whether it shows on mobile or on desktop. Again, I don't touch mobile with this application for obvious reasons. And it's just pretty awesome as far as that goes. Now, event handlers are super interesting. 
because this is more or less is defining, which is apparently JavaScript terminology. One of the problems I have with Retool is it's very, you know, JavaScript focused on some respects. But the idea of an event handler is what do I, what do you do when I click the button? It's a button that doesn't do anything when you click it is cathartic, but not the most useful thing in the world. And there are a whole bunch of options. It can control other components. It can run various scripts. You can open URLs in different areas, et cetera, et cetera. And some other JavaScript browser things that I know nothing about. But trigger query is almost always the one that I use for these things. And if I tell it to trigger a query, great. Turns out I have an awful lot of queries that I've built as a part of this application, just because that is how Retool contextualizes almost everything that it does in the context of a query. And if I go over here, for example, to any of these queries, I have some that I named terribly, some that I named increasingly well as time went on, because, hey, maybe I have more than one get query. What a concept. And you can almost see in, in peeling back the layers, the evolution of how I went from crappy to only marginally less crappy in the fullness of time. Now, this, for example, is something that winds up calling out to an endpoint that spits out a variety of different nonsense. Uh, it'll be, of course, censored here when you wind up seeing it on video, but that's not part of Retool itself. It winds up spitting out a whole bunch of nonsense, and if I tell it to preview, it goes ahead and makes the call. And if I bring this up, because it is a, wor a wordy, obnoxious thing, it's big and obnoxious and returns a giant data structure as a result which in turn is what's used to populate that table up above. It runs every time the page gets loaded. Terrific. It is incidentally is designed as a REST API, and we'll get to what you can define those as in a minute, because I think it's really awesome. I have another one here that's a post query in this case that winds up spitting out a, uh, doing a post verb that winds up uh, passing specific JSON objects as a part of this. And there's also a header that I call chicken that I use to keep people like you who are watching this, or if I show someone what I'm doing, from being able to put garbage into my feed because spammers are notorious for doing exactly that. And it grabs, simply put, from other areas in the form, and it goes ahead and submits it. And there's a whole bunch of these, and in this particular case, they're almost all API calls. There are some exceptions, though, such as run a code and define that, run custom code and define that as a query. Devin? Tell me about that, because honestly, this is one of the things I reached out to you folks for help on. I, in theory, understand what it's doing, but in practice, I back away and never touch it, because if I break it, I get to keep the pieces. Totally. So maybe taking a step back, the, the reason we have this at all is we understand that sometimes you're going to want to write some manual operation. Um, and I think you brought up an interesting point, which is that we are really opinionated towards JavaScript. We're, we're not opinionated about many things, but that's one of the few we have today. And that's because what a lot of platforms will try to do is they'll try to create their own language or their own system that you need to learn. And what we wanted to do was just stick with something a little bit more generic that front end engineers, for the most part, understood, which is JavaScript. Uh, and so all throughout Retool, you're able to put queries and reference uh, little bits of JavaScript here and there to really patch the app together how you need. Now, with this specific query that you have in front of us right now, uh, from my understanding, what this is doing is it's going through each item that you've checked in that table above, and it's calling that API endpoint to be able to delete each and every one of those rows that you selected. Now, the reason you aren't able to do this uh, natively from the table is because we want you to have a log of every single record that you ever interacted with, meaning the ones that you checked, and the ones that you checked and then unchecked. That way you know that in some cases, hey, this is something I thought about editing or this is something that we were going to do something with. Uh, and so that's the reason why in this case you'd have to use JavaScript, but as you can tell, for a JavaScript developer, it doesn't take too long to make something like this. And even for somebody who doesn't know JavaScript, it's not crazy to have somebody come in and just write this little blurb for you. Which is exactly what I did. You don't need a lot of development jobs, just a little. And given my prejudices, I tended to put as little logic as possible into the retool application itself, because it's easier for me to just make the Python Lambda function that fires off at the other side of a query do a bunch of the text manipulation and spit out things that I want than it is for me to go spelunking into the wilds of this. Now, because this is more or less a glue application that ties together a bunch of disparate APIs, my belief is that that's probably the right instinct to have 
Stefan, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. I mean, of course, there's value to you retool the company if people are putting business logic into their applications. But given the option, I've always been a fan of sort of abstracting away a little bit from that. Where do you stand? We actually completely agree with you. So we would recommend to someone that you actually don't want to write a lot of this logic inside of a retool app because then you have the same problem that you had when you built the app from scratch, which is you have a lot of bloated logic lying all over the place and it's not necessarily contained or managed in a clean way. And so you're supposed to use things like this, like what we're looking at right now as a stopgap, as something that you don't have to be blocked to build some backend process. You could just do it on the fly and get these things done. Um, but as you also pointed out with your queries, how they got better over time, we expect as you build these apps, you'll find the gaps in your processes, you'll find the gaps in your data, you'll find the gaps in the actual application you have and make those improvements over time. And instead of having to go and update a huge code base every time you want to update the app, with Retool, these updates are really clean. If you wanted to go through and rename all those queries today, take you like 10 minutes, uh, you probably want to sit down and think a little bit about what naming structure makes the most sense for you and your use case, but it doesn't really take that long to go through and clean and organize these things up. So our preference is that you build those types of workflows and those types of business logic settings and workflows and such in your backend, and then you just call those directly from the retool front end. I want to be clear that the reason I haven't done that is that once I get a capability set up or I get this configured the way I want, I go months without ever looking at the edit view on this. I set it up, it just works. It doesn't nag me about, oh, there's new capabilities and features enabled, which is a little odd sometimes because it's more or less some of this is how Retool existed three years ago. And there have been advancements to the product. It turns out, generally, companies don't raise money and then spend none of it on improving the product. Yep, we're feature complete. We're letting go of all our engineers and now it's strictly a marketing effort and sales work. It doesn't work that way. But I've never once had just logged in one day and today it's broken. And the thing that you built a month or year, or two years ago, suddenly no longer works. And that's incredibly important given that in some cases, I'm not the person that built the custom JavaScript around some of these things. Yeah, people are really trusting us with their internal business operations. These are not applications that are necessarily toys. These are things that people use to do real work every single day and to run their businesses. And so we understand that there are some trade-offs that we need to make when you allow someone to build something uh, for their business and that is custom to their specific needs. And so with that, we do make improvements all the time. We, we update our components. We actually just released a full suite of V2 components, but we don't require you to update to them because we understand that our old components work just fine and probably are great for the use case that you built them for. But that said, we do provide ways to easily upgrade to the new versions when you're ready. So you're not required. It's recommended when it makes sense for your use case. Uh, but at the end of the day, the retool apps are supposed to be for you and for you to do great work and not for us to dictate exactly how things should be for you. One of the things that always, uh, I guess, throws me for a bit of a loop has, oh, has been that the way that I think about resources in, in the world of retool. Here, for example, are all the resources that I have defined so far. I added a single um, DynamoDB entry for a different application that winds up uh, intentionally anonymizing uh, clicks, accounts for just once behavior. So I know what the popular links in an issue are, but I have no idea based upon that who has clicked them because I don't care what you personally click on, but I'd love to know that 5,000 people clicked a given link because, ooh, if people are that interested, there's something else going on. I wonder what the deal is. It's also, but what I want to talk about here specifically is that most of the stuff I have defined has been simple REST APIs. And that's an artifact of how I wound up building these things. I was originally hitting this with curl. So I, that's obnoxious. You need to have, at least at the time, a, an API gateway in some form in front of a Lambda function in order to trigger that. So I built that out and I didn't see the reason or value in backtracking and doing any of those things. But if I go and hit create new, you have internal support for an awful lot of different things, some of which people have heard of and are customers of, other things people have not. You have a whole bunch of databases, though I do point out Route 53 or any other DNS server is not being misused as a database here. So that's a bit of a miss from a product perspective. But you also hit a whole bunch of different APIs of things that people care about. An easy example is now you can apparently invoke lambdas themselves. Well, 
that wasn't really a thing back when I started using this. Same story with right now, so many of those APIs and lambdas that I have then in turn put in between the API gateway and DynamoDB, possibly unnecessarily, depending on how deep down the, Dynamo, down the DynamoDB API gateway integration you want to go, was a little, a little weird. So I'm curious to know what is the best practice that you recommend for stuff like this? Should people build in this agnostic layer of abstraction? Should they just talk directly to the underlying resources? How do you think about that? So there, there's my personal preference here, but that's not necessarily Retool's preference. And, and Retool's I'd preference love to hear both. is uh, to, to be really agnostic to these kinds of things. You should be following whatever practice makes the most sense for your business. Now, from my standpoint, you should probably have an API layer in front of your database in most cases, depending on what data is in the database. Um, but when it comes down to it, we understand that businesses go both ways. Sometimes they prefer that API layer for authentication before somebody performs certain operations, or they prefer to create certain operations that are only API accessible that communicate with the database. And so in those cases, you can do that. In other cases, you really just want to say select star from users and have that be that. And so in that case, you connect directly to the database and you can go from there. We also provide options as well if you prefer to only do your reads from databases and not write so that you can restrict that off. You can say that I'm connecting to this database, but I only want it to pull data in. I don't want to write back natively directly to the database. So we make that all, all clean and structured. Uh, another thing you pointed out as well that I want to touch on is that um, I, I don't know when we released our, our Lambda resource integration, uh, but your case is super common in that we are never going to be able to encapsulate every single integration there is in this world. There are so many third-party apps, there are so many third-party resources, and we can only tackle so many of those. And oftentimes we have to go with what's the most popular, what is being most used, and that's what we're going to natively support. But we understand that you can't be sitting around, your business can't wait for us to make an integration. And so that's why we've invested heavily in not only the REST API resource, but also the GraphQL resource and the Open API resource so that at the end of the day, there's probably an API to whatever you're trying to interact with. And so you, you can still make those connections uh, until we make a native integration. It's also worth pointing out that in many cases, I don't pay attention to a lot of these things because, and I hit the, the native API case because on iOS, for example, having a JavaScript bookmarklet that makes a post call to some random third-party API, as far as the website is concerned, is the right way to do it. But I have to work within the confines of Apple shortcuts, for example, when I'm using iOS and those things are impossible to debug. I can basically tell it to take this URL and this title as the following body uh, or header parameters to a post call to this API. But anything more complex than that is just absolutely a non-starter. So having the ability for multiple clients in different ways to wind up making those calls out is super important for me in this particular use case. If Retool were the only way I was interacting with these resources, I would almost certainly feel different, except that for an awful lot of the data stores themselves, it's just not. Totally, totally. We're really just supposed to be a front end on top of your data and meet you where you already are. Like We don't want you to have to suddenly conform your back end and your data sources specifically to us. We want to be as open and as agnostic to whatever your needs are so that you can just slap us in front of your data sources, make the app you need, and go from there. One thing that I've appreciated as well is that I have my ridiculous header authentication check as sort of a poor man's basic auth API type of thing. So I don't have to type in a username or a password every time I wind up uh, uh, using a new device. But it the ability to wind up configuring multiple authentication options is great. Um, easy example, if this is just a standard REST API but you have a bunch of different authentication options built in. None in this case, because I certainly can't teach any of these things that I'm aware of to an Apple shortcut uh, before the heat death of the universe, but you offer a whole bunch of different things, including AWS uh, SIG v4 signing. So if I went with that, you just say, great, what region, what service, what uh, resource do you want to hit? And here's your, here are your credentials. And you store those presumably uh, securely, given that I have never once seen any of these things that I have narrowly scoped and given to you folks have any access attempts other than when explicitly told to. So good work on that. Congratulations. Gold star for you security wise. But also, let's be clear, defense in depth is important. There's a reason I'm not just giving admin credentials to these things. 
Absolutely. Um, and, and we want to be clear as well for organizations that do have to consider a lot of security constraints. Uh, again, we're SOC 2 type 2 compliant and we make sure that everything is stored securely, but that is just words, right? We can say that all we want. And at the end of the day, we want to provide options that make the most sense for your business. And so we also have an on-premise offering. So you can actually deploy Retool within your own infrastructure. It's restricted off from the public internet. And so you're not required to put resource credentials in just to our cloud service. You can deploy it, have it living inside of your environment, and it doesn't have to communicate with the outside world. So both options are available. Um, and another thing I want to touch on as well is we have all these authentication methods. And again, this is another example of we can support all of the major authentication methods and we can write all of those. But sometimes you'll need something custom. Sometimes you will need something that meets some specific workflow that you made. We don't want you to have to conform only to what we have. And so that's why we also have that custom auth flow so that in the event you have some sort of more intricate flow, you can define that inside of the resource as well uh, for whatever makes the most sense for you and your organization. I look at these things and my mind just starts boggling because the possibilities are endless and I know it's going to be stupendously complex and almost certainly highly enterprisey, but it, it's, it's a useful thing to have. Bounding scope is super important and you can do a lot of things with some of the enterprise and business level tiers that I generally don't bother with because for the moment, I'm the only person that really builds these apps at the Duckbill Group. But you can ha you can start partitioning it off of this group of people can access this subset of applications as an editor or as a viewer. You can do some fairly extensive work with role-based access control. And that means that you can have folks doing just the things that are needed. I, for example, have bounded the team that handles a lot of the sponsorship stuff, their view only on their sponsorship application side of the world, where they can't inadvertently click the wrong thing and break stuff. They don't, just as the uh, the firewall keeps me from going and poking around in what the uh, sponsors are on a week-to-week -week basis, they also can't see what I'm writing and talking about. So that is very much an intentional design decision as we do these things. It may seem a little overwrought when it's just me, but as we continue to grow in complexity, scale, and size, we're seeing more use cases for Retool, not fewer. I think that's, that's exactly the right way to, to think about it. I would agree with everything you said. Now... Criticisms. That's always fun to have. Uh, well, before we get into criticisms, let's talk about the query library as well, which is super handy. This is something I really should have been using more often for some of the cross app stuff where I can define an API and specific calls so that I can update them in one place as opposed to every place they wind up getting addressed. There's a refactor in here somewhere at some point that I'll do when I have a rainy day, but by and large, it's not something that I am particularly concerned about doing in the near future, just because what I have works and to-do lists are aspirational at best. It's, is this the most important thing I should be working on right now? No, refactoring an internal app that only I am really aware of how it works, not the most pressing thing in the world. I just curse myself every time I look at it instead and life goes on. Yeah, when, when it's just you, you can really follow whatever flows make the most sense for you. And what we want to make sure of is that as you do scale, as you do bring more people onto the platform, you're able to make those changes very quickly. So one example is if you see a query that you have rewritten over and over and over again from app to app to app, and you say, okay, I need to just put this in the query library and have it be available there for future reference. We actually have the ability inside of the app to go to that specific query and then export that to the query library. So this is something that I do all the time because in intuitively you don't necessarily think to yourself, oh, I'm going to use this over and over again. And so uh, one example is we have a resource internally that pulls a list of all of our Salesforce users. And I realized that this query is exactly the same over and over in all these apps. So why am I rewriting it every single time and, and struggling with SQL, which is just horrible to deal with in general. Uh, and so instead, what we were able to do is take that query, export it to our query library, and now I don't have to think about it. Now just anytime I want access to that, I'm able to pull it into the app and say, this is our Salesforce users query. We use it and we go from there. It's incredibly handy when you start building multiple applications. I started with one for the longest time and only had to then clone that for the sponsor folks side of the house. And that in turn was just easy enough because all the queries wound up getting duplicated. Then they've diverged since then. And now I'm managing things in two places. And again, it goes beyond the, the just talking to third-party APIs sometimes. 
if I take a look at what's currently in the hopper around, oh, I don't know, integrate AWS IoT and Esri ArcGIS velocity for real-time utility dashboards and analysis. I have absolutely no idea what the hell that means because it's inscrutable and it's an AWS series of words. I can hit the visit site button. It pops open a new tab, shows me exactly what the thing is. And oh, great. Does this make it better? Absolutely not. It's still unclear what it is. So great. I can close that out, go back to what I was doing and whack the delete button, which does exactly what you'd expect it to. Done. And then I don't have to think about it anymore. The idea of it, there's nothing here that bounds me to within this, within the confines of this. I can hit the button, it fires it up in a new tab or not. It's incredibly useful to just be able to put the most common things that I do here. I can drop a link in and create something new because yes, the link combined with the issue number is the unique key for DynamoDB for you database friends out there. I can write whatever content I want, put whatever title it in. What issue do I want to go? Eh, this is a next week thing. Great. I can drop it into a variety of different sections in the newsletter, depending on where it is. And then I hit create and we're done. Note to self, I should remove that shit post button because that's going to confuse the living hell out of me when I've forgotten having worked on this video recording with you. So that is that was great, but then I was doing stuff for the longest time of having to take the title and when it was all recorded and as a podcast and ready to go, I would then have to type the title in manually. So I had the copy button ready to go. And then I would go ahead and talk to my folks in a Slack team and, hey, this issue with this title is up and ready to go. Oh, wait, that's right. I can just hit that button there. It'll automatically then just hit a webhook and drop it the right message into the right Slack team parameterized with those values. And I don't have to think about it. It turns out that there's a lot of automation possibility around here of click the button. Eventually, you'll get to what I did a while back. And I had a button to reset everything for the next issue, which fundamentally meant increase the issue number by one because yes, integers, that's how it works. And then anything new that comes in goes to the new one. Well, what's better than clicking a button? Automating it. So now at a fixed point in time every week, that gets automatically done. I don't have to think about it. And then I'm ready to go to start working on putting together that week's issue or issue series, I suppose. Is this overwrought? Almost certainly. Is there anything like this that I've seen out there that I could have bought off the shelf? No, not that, not that I've ever looked at. If I were doing one issue a week in, uh, that was completely distinct from the others, that, that different sources and different coverage areas, maybe, but they're all not particularly aligned with how I view things. It doesn't work for me well enough. The only option I had was custom development. And I'm just so glad that I found Retool and it worked the way that it has. This is something that I've been a passionate supporter of for a while now. And again, my use case is ridiculous and nonsense, but every internal application at most companies has elements of that. It's, well, it's just an internal process and it's bad and broken. And I'm sure other people have other ways of solving these problems. Not really. Everything's bespoke and horrible in its own unique ways. Take a look at this. It's worth exploring. There's a free tier that I started off with because I don't know, I'm, I'm giving money for $10 a month. That seems like expensive. I'm going to spend eight hours kicking the tires on it instead before I make a $10 investment. Yeah, don't think like that, but it's worth pursuing. And given that a number of your reference customers are you know, in the finance space, it's clear that this is not just for random, ridiculous nonsense like I've built, but for things that people are using for internal processes at highly regulated companies. It really is one of those fundamental tools that I am astounded that nothing else has captured in quite this way. My biggest concern is the fact that it's retool or a bunch of garbage. Everything else I've looked at and kicked the tires on is either de deeply devoted to its own internal concept of what a database is, only begrudgingly supports REST APIs at best and forget anything looking like authentication with them. It just, it feels like you folks are five years ahead somehow of everyone else in the space. And I, for the life of me, don't understand that. But I'm glad I found you. I'm glad you found us as well, Corey. I think a lot of this all comes back to the fact that we don't want to be opinionated about how you should run your business. And a lot of these other platforms, a lot of these other options, you'll see that they, they are opinionated. They want you to use their database. They want you to use their specific way of doing things. And we just want you to do things the way you're going to do them, effective or not. Because as you touched on, a lot of these things are bespoke as well, where these processes might not be the most efficient way of doing these things. These processes might not be the absolute top tier best way, 
but they work for you. And why spend a bunch of time building an inefficient process from scratch when you can build a fast and retool, iterate on it quickly, and then as you find these little areas that you can improve, they just come with time. You find a process you can automate, now you can focus on that instead of focusing on building the whole app from scratch. There really, you really can't say enough nice things about just the flexibility here. Never once have I felt like I was fighting upstream against the tool, with the possible exception of trying to do, edit the layout on iPad. Turns out that it sort of assumes you have a mouse and an actual desktop environment. But again, how often does someone really need to do stuff like that? It works. It just ruins some of the grid layout sometimes. Not the worst case in the world as far as failure modes go. It works. It's just ungainly. There are remarkably few complaints that I have about this, and never once have I been told, oh, you're just thinking about this completely wrong, which I almost certainly am. But it's been such a welcoming, warm experience that I just can't say enough nice things about you folks, so I'm going to give up on trying. Appreciate you saying that, Corey, uh, and happy this has worked well for you. So thank you for taking the time out of your day to suffer my slings, arrows, and a tour through my wanton misuse of your product. If people want to learn more about you and Retool, where's the best place to do it? They can go to retool.com uh, or if you want to reach out directly, it's just devin at retool.com and I'm happy to have a conversation. Excellent. Thanks again. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Corey. Have a good day. If you've enjoyed this podcast, smash the like and subscribe button and leave a nice comment. If you've hated this entire video podcast, Continue to smash the like and subscribe button, but leave an incredibly insulting comment at the bottom how the simple solution here is just to spend six months at a boot camp learning JavaScript myself so I can implement a lot of this stuff terribly.